Hello friends, thanks for checking out the video. Be sure to like and subscribe as it greatly helps out the channel and I'd really appreciate it. Enjoy. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to another episode of A Social Inquiry. I am your host, Dr. Duality, and I'm very excited to announce our guest today, uh, Dr. Marcus Schaefer. Uh, recently moved from Canada, so I know quite the big change, but uh, Marcus, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Really looking forward to it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, so today, everyone, we are going to be discussing a couple of articles, uh, changing it up a little, looking a little bit at religion, but really focusing on uh, older adults and especially feelings of loneliness and the kind of health impacts kind of on a broader range that we have. And many of you could probably figure that this is rather important given the recent, you know, world events, right? Uh, clearly the COVID-19 pandemic and its uh, forcing of many people to go into uh, various levels of isolation. Uh, so uh, Marcus, if you would, uh, can you please kind of talk to us uh, what you're currently working on, um, you know, research-wise? Yeah, thanks Colton. So, uh, you know, as you said, uh, a lot of my research does focus on loneliness and social isolation of older adults. And I have a number of different projects that are kind of building on some of those themes. And so some of the things I'm doing right now is, and I guess we'll talk a little bit about this project, but I have another kind of branch of this project that looks at um, how basically people's geographical distance to the people that they're otherwise close to, the people that are emotionally close or important to them, but nevertheless, they have an arm's length kind of geographically that live far away. And so we're working on a couple of my uh, former students and current students of mine are working on projects that ask questions like, what happens uh, when people lose important ties in their lives? And does it matter whether those people that they lose, whether it's through a conflict or whether it's through death or through health problem, they're no longer really to talk to them as much or see them as much. Does it matter if those people are far away or if those people are close by, if they're in their neighborhood? And so we're kind of looking at whether uh, proximity and geographical closeness really matters in terms of who people hold on to as they progress through their later years. Um, so that's kind of one side of it. Um, another set of projects I'm looking at right now is kind of asking questions about age discrimination in the United States and trying to basically figure out the extent to which uh, age discrimination happens in different sorts of uh, institutional contexts. So, for instance, we're going to do a project uh, kind of that's rolling out right now that's about age discrimination in churches and uh, places of worship to see whether they express more interest in potential congregants that are younger rather than people that are potentially older. And another set of field experiments is going to try to broaden that out to other types of uh, nonprofit organizations, too. Wow, that's really cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'd love to definitely uh, pick your brain more on that, uh, especially once you, you know, start getting some findings and uh, getting further along the research because age discrimination in church is honestly not something I ever uh, thought about, especially, you know, it might be, uh, you know, me being a bit naive, but, you know, uh, again, with the pandemic and everything, I would think, you know, churches are desperately trying to get whomever they can uh, to attend and bring them in. So uh, very cool, uh, very interesting. And so I guess this kind of touch might touch in part, but, you know, since we're going to be talking about older adults, we talked about, you know, the kind of geographical location, what really spurned your interest in this research area? So I kind of got interested in this back about 12, 15 years ago when I was in graduate school. So I started at Purdue uh, in graduate school in sociology back in 2005, um, I guess 17, 18 years ago. And uh, when I started my graduate program, I enrolled in kind of a dual program that studied both sociology, but also gerontology, the study of aging. And at Purdue at the time, they had this really innovative kind of community partnership with the University Gerontology Center and a local retirement community. And they were kind of looking for graduate students to live in the retirement community to be sort of full-fledged members of the community, to serve on committees, to just be, go to dinner, to go to activities and just kind of enter into the life of those retirement communities uh, locally. And also to kind of be the bridge between the university and that setting. And so I jumped at that chance. It would seem like a kind of unique once in a lifetime or may, maybe twice in a lifetime opportunity for me to have. So as a young 
you know, in my early 20s as a young person, I got to live among older people in this community. And I just kind of learned a lot about aging kind of in practice that I never would have probably learned just through reading textbooks or research articles. And it was a really eye-opening experience. And it kind of gave me a set of ideas for things that I really wanted to study. And, and one of the things I really kind of became intrigued by um, was how these were people who kind of came to the community under the assumption that they would have a really active lifestyle and be able to play cards, eat dinner, congregate, you know, have fun with people that they had known in the community um, much of their lives. But what I found is that health really became this kind of um, barrier for a lot of people to sort of full-fledged participation in the community. And so I became intrigued by that. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I, having kind of a, my foot in the door here at this community, whether I could come back several years later when it was time for me to do my dissertation uh, work um, to actually study the social connections, the social networks among people that live in the community and to try to tease apart how much of an impact health had and how social relationships were structured in that community. So I did field work. I interviewed over 100 people in this retirement community, and that became kind of my dissertation project. And from there, I became interested in looking not just in this one kind of small contained community, but started to look at social relationships and networks of older people uh, and across a bunch of whole different settings. Wow. Um, okay, so that's really cool. So this has really been a uh, kind of career long project, you know, ever since grad school. Uh, that's, I guess, not too uh, surprising because uh, that's more or less where I've really started feeling uh, my stride for uh, intimate partner violence and, you know, various effects. So. You've definitely then been exposed to a lot of research and, you know, different uh, facets of, you know, gerontology, uh, the various health aspects. I know, you know, religion, we were kind of talking a little bit before stream and, uh, you know, how we have both looked at, especially you yourself, you know, looked at a lot of uh, religious research and health implications. And uh, again, everyone chat, uh, we're going to be touching on a bit of that as we progress through these articles. And uh, this last question, uh, kind of before we really dive in, is what are some reasons, right, that this area of research should be of increasing concern to uh, policymakers or just the general public? Well, I think there's pretty strong evidence now from a lot of different studies all over the world that um, humans are really made to connect to one another and that the single most important thing, um, it's appearing more and more uh, for people to live long, happy, satisfied lives is to have strong relationships and connections with others. Um, there was a really interesting um, meta-analysis that kind of puts together, smushes together findings from dozens and dozens of studies the world over. And the basic conclusion from this a couple of years ago was that for older people, being in networks that are strongly supportive, that are large, where people have other people they can talk to and see regularly, um, that that's really as important for health and longevity as things like avoiding heavy drinking or staying fit and avoiding a sedentary lifestyle or even avoiding smoking. And so I found that evidence to be really compelling. And I, I think we're, we're knowing this more and more that isolation is really bad for people. Um, but as you said, with the COVID-19 pandemic and all the aftermath of that and how people are trying to basically stitch together a lot of their lives that they had before the pandemic, I think in the years to come, it's gonna be really important for us to figure out just to document um, how well connected older adults are becoming and identifying maybe what some of the barriers are to connection and helping people alleviate that. Well, and I think one of the big barriers and uh, gets uh, some mention in this first article we're going to be talking about is, right, technology. Uh, advent of technology has made, you know, connections, uh, you know, one could say easier, but, you know, still figuring that out is a major obstacle. Uh, so without getting too much into spoilers, everyone, let's uh, dive down into our first article uh, titled Close Ties Near and Far Away patterns and predictors of geographic network range among older Europeans. And in this article, uh, you know, as we kind of work through it, the first thing you discuss is, uh, you know, network typologies as a way to understand social connections among aging adults. So would you mind uh, elaborating on, you know, these kind of network typologies and why they are, you know, such an established method in this uh, research field. 
Yeah. So, I mean, think about social connectedness as a concept, and it's pretty complex and multifaceted, right? So how connected you are is some function of something like, you know, who are the people in your life that are important to you? Or what are their roles to you? Do you have neighbors, friends, spouses, children? Who are the people that are in your life? How much do you talk with them? How much do you see them? Kind of what role do they play? Do they serve companionship needs of yours? Do they help you when you have troubles? There's many, many different dimensions and facets to this concept of social connectedness. So the idea of kind of topologies is to kind of think about what are the, 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 the many different dimensions that could be out there? And is there a way to kind of put people into categories and kind of arrange them and to say, this is the kind of person that has, say, a, a small network comprised mainly of family members, or this is a person that has maybe a lot of neighbors close by, and that's kind of what their network looks like. Uh, maybe this person has a really diverse mix of people. They've got people living far away, some children, some non-kin members of their family, and then maybe they also have a few people living in their household. So it's basically this inductive method to take a bunch of different variables that might describe people's social lives and to sort of say, what are the underlying groups? What are these sort of ideal types that we might find in the population? And that's what we used in this paper. And what we tried to really focus on is we wanted to kind of focus on the relationship that people had to others that were, you know, core in their lives, but also the distance and try to figure out, are there sort of sets of people that have important people in their lives that live at different distances from them? Wow. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I kind of, uh, that kind of understanding, I, I think, kind of gets to the point of this is it's able to cover uh, more or less all the different social networking types that individuals may have, right, is that whether it's living with family, being in a, you know, I think as y'all discuss, a very family-centered, uh, you know, culture where, you know, especially something we don't have too much here in the U.S. and, you know, we might touch back on in the second article is things like are you expected to take care of your parents once they become elderly and you become older? And I know that's kind of a gray area here in the U.S. It has a lot more variability, but, you know, in European countries, at least quite a few, it's almost a, you know, for sure uh, type of thing. And then, you know, let alone friends, uh, communities. So uh, with that, we kind of get into, you know, how important it is between, you know, y'all call it network proximity and the richness or, you know, uh, could you say effectiveness of social interactions. But something y'all uh, kind of discussed that kind of stood out to me was it seemed almost like having more, you know, I, I kind of thought of it as, you know, quantity over quality, right? Just having more social uh, connections, interactions was more valuable than perhaps say, a you know, a few very uh, strong, you know, ones that you might see or akin to uh, familial uh, compared to just, you know, friends, neighbors. So could you talk about that a little bit, kind of like what y'all were finding or hypothesizing at least? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the case that, you know, this mix of, you know, whether it's more important to have quantity or whether it's important to have quality, um, it seems like there is quite a bit of diversity in the types of networks that people have. Um, some people seem to have their needs met by just having a couple of really close knit people in their lives. You know, maybe it's not having, you know, quite that whole mix of a diverse range. Um, and there seems to be some real benefits to that. So in terms of whether, you know, if you just have a spouse or maybe you just have one close neighbor, um, maybe some of your needs could be met in terms of having a companion at home or having someone that can help, you know, shovel the snow, you know, up in the Nordic countries when it starts to snow. Maybe you have those kind of needs, those simple needs in your life met. Maybe for other people though, you know, having a, a diverse mix of people, having people that are, um, you can talk to about different issues, not, you know, outside of your family, about diverse interests that you might have, people that you might see at clubs or volunteering organizations or at churches. Um, for some people, that seems to be really what's most important and having this range of different connections. And, People kind of asked this question. They've kind of looked at data and, and kind of said, what is more important, just to have um, kind of a diverse mix or one or two really close people? And it seems like for different outcomes or different things we might be interested in knowing about quality of life, those two different types of networks might play different roles. So for instance, there's a lot of evidence that 
having a more diverse range of people in your life is really good for cognitive stimulation and helps stave off dementia. Um, on the other hand, if it's just about, say, alleviating loneliness, it seems like the real key is just having at least one core confidant, somebody that's close by, especially that you might live with, that can really help you feel like you belong to somebody else. And so, again, it does kind of a little bit depend on what particular outcome that we're interested in. Wow. Okay. That that does make a lot of sense. I know, especially... Um you know, you talk about cognitive health, you know, staving off dementia. And uh, I, I think perhaps even in a you know, broader sense, right, this uh, overall sense of loneliness that people have become or experienced um, in higher level in the past, you know, couple of years due to the pandemic and the, uh, you know, closing down, masking, isolation, again, even especially uh, major events. Uh, I know here in Texas, now uh, you get to experience things like fiesta, Right. I can't remember the last time Fiesta was, you know, shut down, but typically it's this huge uh, party, these uh, multiple uh, massive gatherings and events. Uh, we already kind of talked about, you know, churches, just, you, you know, the whole gambit of any sort of social interaction. So, yes, you know, those being essentially removed and people having to, you know, find ways to supplement. So the fact that, uh, you know, Again, talking about having multiple interactions and how that could still transpire despite the shutoff of formal uh, avenues, if you will. Uh, really interesting and it kind of leads to some, I thought some fascinating uh, results and just you know, kind of further uh, questions from what y'all were uh, finding and exploring. And so I, I did have to ask, uh, what drew y'all to study uh, Europeans? Because this is right, a strict uh, European sample that y'all uh, were looking at. And kind of a uh, second point to that question is, to what extent do you think your findings uh, will would translate to you know, uh, U, their US counterparts? Yeah, I mean, I think Europe is interesting because you know within this one continent, you have such a diverse, range of uh, cultural traditions and institutions and, and different types of welfare states, you know, within the continent. Um, and so if you think back even, you know, to feudal times, there's this argument that, you know, going back to them, the, the Western uh, European countries, the Central European countries, places like Austria, Germany, uh, those sorts of countries um, kind of developed where people spread out when people, once they started owning land and um, once they started farming, uh, they really tended to spread out and, 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 and intergenerational relationships tended to be kind of at a distance, um, even from, um, you know, a few hundred years back, um, kind of out of the emergence of that agrarian system. And then if you look at, you know, especially Northern European countries like the Nordic states, there tends to be a much more uh, sense of individualism there and kind of people are comfortable, uh, much more living alone. People don't have as close a family relationships, especially intergenerationally. Then you contrast that with places like the Mediterranean regions where there's this really strong history of having multiple generations, you know, even living within the same village, within the same home. And so there's kind of just kind of sets out these different expectations about what networks look like. Is it more important to have close by face-to-face -face relationships with kind of a, just a trusted few, or does social life work more comfortably when people are able to navigate sort of longer distance relationships with people outside, the, with outside, outside of their kinship system, you know, people that they know in other settings, you know, in, from organizations or people that are non-kin. And so that kind of range of different expectations and cultural traditions, I think, makes for a, an interesting place to compare across different countries. Yeah, I, I'd say so. I mean, and you bring, uh, as someone who loves history, right, the whole historical context behind uh, Europe, uh, you know, discuss the feudal societies, but just how this kind of social interaction and networking is so ingrained, you know, it's been, you know, centuries um, over there and kind of how we still see, you know, how has that still been passed down? And I guess, would you say that was kind of like the goal of your study was just to see how these differing uh, social networking, right? It's, you know, despite distance and proximity and uh, number of interactions, right, were kind of varying and how telling they were on being beneficial to older adults and combating something like loneliness. 
Yeah, so we wanted to basically boil down people's networks into these different kind of ideal types and to see whether, um, kind of looking across the continent of Europe, is there some kind of a consistency where you start, where you see kind of the breakdown of, you know, some people have really close spy networks, some people have networks that are far more geographically expanded. And one of the thoughts that we had was that we would see a lot more of the sort of close by networks common in Southern Europe as well as Eastern Europe, whereas we thought we'd see more expansive, more elastic types of networks in places like Northern Europe and, and Western Central Europe. And that was borne out quite a bit in the data. Uh, we did see that, 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 that there was kind of this uh, split between those, those two kind of broad regions um, of the continent. But we also did find that even in places like Greece and Spain and Italy, that there was, even there, quite a bit of uh, uh, geographical spread, too, for people's networks. So there is actually diversity, not just between different regions, but also within different regions of Europe. Makes sense. Um, I think that's really cool, uh, really kind of, you know, kind of enlightening, because, uh, again, I think many of the viewers might see it as, you know, European countries, especially Greece, right? Um, have certain ideologies on those being very, yes, family oriented, but all close by, you know, you, you know, within country, like no one really moves or explores too far outside of where they were born. I mean, that's to an extent, a general trend, just at least here in the US, right, is a lot of people live and die, uh, was it like within five miles of where they were born or where they moved, so, something, uh, crazy like that, just kind of highlighting how individuals may not be so akin to moving, but especially that might seem uh, or would be believed to be more apparent in Europe. So very interesting that that's not necessarily the case and that, you know, the kind of uh, health implications uh, that that can have on something like loneliness is, you know, kind of what you are getting at with uh, you know, so uh, chat again, feel free to ask questions uh, anytime if you have any and, you know, as we get into these results, uh, kind of looking at what y'all finding, and uh, Marcus, I know you already started, you know, we're uh, beginning to touch on them, but the first one that, you know, I kind of have that stood out to me was you talk about mid-range and distant family uh, networks that lack a discussant uh, nearby. Uh, so uh, chat basically, right? So someone not necessarily in the household yet they still sustain a high emotional closeness with family uh, discussants or members at a distance and express, they still express high overall satisfaction with their network. So my guess, my question to you is, what kind of explains that? Is it, you know, again, the improvements in technology like Zoom and Teams uh, that's allowed for that high level of satisfaction to uh, sustain itself? Yeah, I really wish that we would have conducted this study once kind of Zoom had really proliferated like it had during the pandemic. So that our data actually come just a couple of years before the pandemic, I think. Wow. You're, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 2018 or 2017 was the most recent wave of the data we're working with. Is, is that right? That does sound right, because, you know, it was published in 21, but you're right. The data came out yeah. uh, a few years before. Yeah, so so unfortunately, you know, we we really don't aren't able to see the rollout of some of those tools, and it was I think it's let the case. You know, there's some, so I think there's some data that show this that you know there was this really stark, quick uptake for a lot of these um, platforms during COVID. But before COVID, mm -hmm. these were not really household um, platforms for a lot of older adults. So I'm I am skeptical that it's really just Zoom on its own that might explain this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be, you know, people certainly have used telephones for a long time and are able to connect that way. Um, but I think there's a couple of things happening there. So you mentioned kind of people that have what we called mid-range or long-range extended types of networks. And these are people, if we look at the sort of summary of all the different people who they say are important in their life, they tend to have a few, at least a few people that are, I think we quantify it as more than 50 kilometers away as being kind of long distance. Um, and I guess in miles in the states, you just multiply that by <laughs> point, you know, six two or so, um, you know, to get to get miles. Um, but these are people that you know they're 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 at least a pretty you know at least a car ride away. They're not people you can walk or cycle over to easily. Um, 
And so what we found, though, is even if people are kind of characterized by having these long ranging types of networks, oftentimes they do have at least one person maybe that also lives close by. And so it may be that, you know, they have their needs met in different ways. They can still stay connected, say, to adult children that have moved out of the town, maybe that took a job far away, maybe even outside the country, have moved across the Eurozone even perhaps, and they're able to connect with them through technology or see them occasionally. But they're also able to meet some of their needs by, you know, maybe a spouse that lives nearby or a romantic partner that maybe lives, you know, in the same village or the same town. So that's one thing that I might help to explain why people as a whole, even if they have long ranging networks, don't tend to report less satisfaction with their networks or less emotional closeness to their network as a whole, because they're kind of getting their needs met in different ways. The other thing I might say, though, is that if someone does have somebody who they name as part of their kind of close core network, and yet they live really far away, there's kind of a selection effect, I think, happening there, where the reason that they're naming them as important in their life is because they are really close emotionally to them. So their child, for instance, that moves from Greece to take the job you know, in Hungary or moves all the way out to, to Germany, right, right to work, um, they wouldn't have named that child as an important part of their network if they weren't talking to them regularly, if they weren't really emotionally attached to them. So I think what maybe what these findings show a little bit of is people can be pretty adaptive and pretty resilient in terms of if somebody that's close to them moves far away, um, people aren't willing to let those relationships go, right? It's, it's important to mm -hmm. them to keep that person in their life. And like you said, now that we've got better tools than ever, you know, as the, you know, whatever comes down the pike, whether it's the metaverse or holograms or other <laughs> technology that makes people even more lifelike from great distances. Um, I don't expect that it's going to get, the distance is going to get any less, you know, of a, of a barrier maybe than it already, and than it has been in the past. Very cool. Um, and that does make a lot of sense, especially, you know, the selection effect and right kids, loved ones. Um, yeah, it makes sense that distance, you know, and you kind of mentioned it earlier that despite this being before COVID and yes, the huge uptick of all of a sudden everyone learning how to use a uh, Zoom or, you know, uh, Teams that, you know, people still had a way of connecting. Uh, so, you know, it, it does make sense. I would be curious, I would be curious to see how if at all that has improved due to the technological advances and more or less that everyone, I'd say to a large extent, all age ranges becoming at least somewhat familiar or utilizing those connections to kind of help set up, you know, uh, these improved ways of maintaining some sort of connection uh, that still has that personal touch. I mean, even, geez, was it uh, like FaceTime on, you know, iPhones now, right? So it's, but various ways, uh, you know, to maintain, you know, being able to just not just hear someone's voice, but see them face to face. So, uh, okay, that I mean, that does make a lot of sense. I, I think it's, you know, something worth, you know, uh, continuing to watch and see how it expands and improves. And this kind of then uh, leads me to the second finding I, you know, really stood out to me and y'all uh, really highlight it is y'all talk about proximate diverse networks uh, with a strong representation of non-kin members nearby are less advantageous, uh, even though they provide relatively frequent contact, but the lowest level of network satisfaction. So to me, this, you know, and chat, uh, in case, you know, y'all might be interested as well, this kind of reads as Having, you know, a multitude of friends or neighbors, you know, if you could kind of elaborate on what helps constitute these kind of networks and why there's, you know, satisfaction, even though they're, you know, uh, have frequent contact with them, may not be as meaningful as, you know, again, it might seem obvious, you know, a connection with a child or a loved one. Yeah, we were actually a little surprised by the, the drop off in how satisfied people were with these proximal close by networks relative to other types of networks where people were more spread out. We actually kind of had anticipated um, that if you had clear people, and again, the, the way that people get into these networks to be considered part of the network was they have to be people that are important to you in some way. So you identify on this 
survey, um, up to seven people that are important to you in your life that you can go to if you want to talk to important matters, share good news, share bad news, people that are there for you. And we had kind of anticipated that, you know, in these data, we would see, you know, if you have a lot of people close by, um, then that's really going to have some benefits. And maybe, you know, the satisfaction you have with your network as a whole would be pretty much on par with maybe having your family members that are at a distance. But you're right, it turned out that people were much more satisfied even with these longer ranging networks that included family members than they were with having, you know, neighbors or close friends within five kilometers or so. And, um, I, you know, you asked earlier about whether we would expect to see the same patterns in the United States. And this is one of those findings where actually I would like to compare it to the United States. I have a hunch that a lot of this you know, finding might be driven by these more familialistic types of cultures in maybe Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, where you do see a really pronounced importance of family. And maybe friends are, are fine and neighbors are fine uh, for, for what they can do, but there seems to be some level of satisfaction that can only really be met, at least in, in the European context, by, by family members. Yeah, that really, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head, like uh, just to me, that seems so interesting, like the level, the, because, you know, at least, and again, everyone excuse my uh, naivety with just the idea, like, especially here in the U.S., you know, you have families close, I, I guess it does depend to an extent how you're brought up, but especially once you go off to college, right, it's, you know, your groups, your social grouping expectations, who you find yourself close with, starts changing drastically right becomes more associated with the friends uh once you start a career path uh, i'm not saying you know you leave your family in the dust not at all um but just like that level of closeness and having that interconnectedness uh i, I was just surprised that it, you know there's such a stark uh difference i i think that's really interesting and again echoing i really would be curious to see how that would reflect on uh us you know especially is it uh, how how much does it vary by uh, regions, you know, East Coast, Central, uh, good old here in Texas versus West Coast. So, yeah, I, I really do. I, I think, you know, the findings y'all had, I, I think uh, it's great. And it's also one of those that raises a lot of questions, you know, a lot of intrigue, which is uh, one reason I love this field. Uh, there's always something more to add and explore. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. is pretty uncommon in terms of the geographic mobility. Like you said, a lot of times people go off to college and they leave Iowa and they go to New York City or they, you know, migrate down from California down down here to Texas. Um, and the Eurozone kind of enabled a lot more of that mobility across Europe, but there's still these kind of linguistic and cultural traditions that really make it challenging, I think, to, to move mm -hmm. uh, from a place like Spain up to Sweden. For, you know, for instance, to, mm -hmm. to take work. And some people make those kind of moves, but I think it's just a lot less common in terms of how, uh, you know, prevalent that it would be in, in Europe. Absolutely. Well, I, and not to mention uh, language barriers, right? I mean, people, I think to an extent, rightfully so, give uh, the U.S. a lot of grief about not knowing geography, but that's because, you know, Europe, instead of having states, right, you have all the different countries, but the amount of languages, um, right, needed to really, you know, like I said, going from Greece to taking a job in Germany, uh, that's going to be a major culture shock. Um, you know, I think to an extent, probably more than, you know, if you went from, uh, as you said, uh, Idaho or Iowa to New York, you know, yeah, there's going to be a culture shock, you know, big city life, but um, I, yeah, just those kind of differences are really, yeah, uh, have some questions uh, popping up, but really, you know, interesting. I'd be really curious to see how that, you know, kind of would pan out more so. I think kind of like catching along, going along with, you know, this kind of, again, geographical networking uh, seems to make sense. A lot of interest and in comparisons with the U.S. So to that extent, uh, use that as much as I can as a segue to this uh, second article that also, you know, includes uh, American and European adults. Uh, this article, everyone, is called Compensatory Connections, Living Alone, Loneliness, and the Buffering Role of Social Connections Among Older Americans and European Adults. Um, so, right, 
living, loneliness, uh, we've all been there, but how is this more impactful and how do we see it amongst older, uh, older populations, which I think y'all bring some really interesting and really important uh, questions that might honestly be overlooked in the day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, amongst the general population. So uh, to begin, y'all talk about the compensatory connection hypothesis. I uh, can't just, you know, uh, let everyone know kind of what that is. Yeah, so the basic idea is, I mean, the, the problem that we're looking at here, again, is, is um, you know, it's known that people that live alone tend to feel lonelier, right? There's a multiple risk factors for loneliness in later life. Um, living alone is one of the major ones. Uh, that isn't to say that everyone who lives alone wishes they live with others. A lot of people are perfectly happy living alone. Um, but of the various things that predict whether people have these feelings of not having their social needs met, Living alone is really one of the, if not the major demographic predictor, you know, the, the, the chief explanation of it. The idea here, though, is, is that people could compensate for living alone by having rich social networks outside of their home um, and a lot of community engagement. And so we were asking the question, you know, if somebody lives alone, but yet they are involved in their community through organizations and clubs, uh, if they have large, diverse, rich networks, uh, people they see regularly, um, can that situation kind of offset their living arrangement? And like you said, we were looking at that both in US uh, as well as Europe to see whether that compensatory pattern would play out the same or, or differently in both contexts. Yeah, I mean, makes makes sense, right? Is uh, I know not to always drag religion back into this, that's just the uh, Chris Elson um, in me coming out. But, uh, you, you know, you talk about communities, things, you know, even attending religious services, right? That's one thing uh, a lot of scholars looking at health and religion kind of notate is it's just the fact that you're getting out, you're getting to a social event, right? Basically, it's very highly community based. Um, that's allowing you to make these kind of connect, uh, just connections or really just interactions, I, I should really say, uh, that help divert feelings of you know, loneliness and perhaps isolation or, you know, right, clubs, even uh, as I know it's become more common uh, since the pandemic, like even things like virtual happy hours, uh, right, is that quasi feeling of you're not face to face, but you're still talking with your friends that, uh, you know, for what the couple years uh, that the pandemic was really in full swing, you weren't able to, or at least supposed to see, you know, on a face-to-face -face basis. So, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it seems pretty, you know, straightforward, understandable, uh, you know, theory in that sense of, you know, compensating uh, regard with the respect, pardon me, to these health concerns. So what were or are the expectations for older adults living alone um, that you found or that you could uh, share with everyone? Yeah, so we kind of thought of two ways that the compensatory connections could play out. One would be that, you know, people that lived alone yet were richly connected outside their house would have loneliness levels that were basically on par with people who lived with others. So basically would offset the, the loneliness penalty of living alone. That was the full compensation idea that we had. But we thought maybe there's just a partial compensation. Maybe there's some benefit if you live alone to being richly connected with others, but it doesn't yet bring you completely in line with what you'd feel like if you lived with other people. And so we tried to sort of test the extent to which compensation worked. And so we gathered the data, same data source uh, from Europe that we talked about in the last article. But then we found another study in the United States that was really nice because it kind of matched the same time frame as the European study, the same years. It was across two different time points um, in the mid-2010 decade. And they also had the same measures, uh, more or less, about people's social networks. So they asked about, again, who are the important people in your life? Uh, what relationship do you have to those people? Um, how often do you see them? And they also asked about things like, like you mentioned, like how often do you go to church? How often do you volunteer in the community? How often do you go to other sort of social clubs and see other people? And so we put together those set different sets of measures, people's networks and also their community engagement. And we looked at uh, an analysis that to try to uh, tease out how much those two types of connectedness, networks and community engagement would offset loneliness of living alone. And it turned out that we were not able to find a full compensatory effect. We were not able to find that that um, 
being connected outside of the house leveled the playing field for people that lived alone versus not live alone. And so what we concluded from that is that there seems to be something very important about the sort of ready companionship that's available to people when they live with a spouse or partner or with, or with somebody else. And um, it was actually pretty consistent. Europe, United States, we actually weren't able to find any different uh, patterns of compensation across those two contexts. Wow. Uh, yeah. And that's, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, pretty interesting, right? That that is, I won't say universal, but, you know, between these two major, uh, you know, societies, you know, I know different countries, but just the fact that having a significant other, right, to that extent is still very paramount in combating the feelings of loneliness, even if you are uh, right, as, as you're saying, without that partner, but still active in the communities, it doesn't fully offset the effects, uh, right? Yeah, so that's, that's a good way to put it, okay. yeah. Okay, um, so, you know, the fact that there seemed to be a general, you know, uniformity between that and the U.S., I think that really is interesting. Um, Chad, I hope you all find that as interesting as I do. Uh, just the fact that there are some factors that can kind of go across uh, the sea or ocean in that sense. So what about how useful then would y'all say, you know, your findings kind of lean to, to understand how uh, having extra household connections, you know, affect uh, compensation. So I guess, you know, it could be your thoughts on additional family members, uh, especially, you know, here um, in Southern states, uh, especially among, you know, uh, cities, what's come to mind was populations with higher uh, Hispanic populations, right? Their culture, uh, more uh, expectation of having extended family, I guess is what I'm trying to get to, living within the household. Like, do y'all think kind of based on your results and what you're finding, would that further strengthen uh, this result, uh, the results y'all found or not, you know, change it too much? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So I think part of what your question is driving at is it doesn't matter who's living, you know, in your house, mm -hmm. for instance, that could alleviate loneliness in this case. Is it a romantic partner that's really most important? Or it, you know, could it be a roommate, could it be an, a family member, an extended family uh, person that's living with you? And you know, that wasn't something that actually we were that we actually dug into in this particular study. So that's kind of a nice follow-up question. Um, in terms of you know, how that would fit in the United States, particularly in, you know, some ethnic communities where intergenerational household is are more common um, than, say, the white uh, majority in the United States. Um, that's a really interesting question. And I do know that, you know, there, there's quite a bit of literature that says that, you know, there can be stresses and strains, whether it's with a partner or whether it's with extended family members in the household. Mm -hmm. It's not always an unalloyed benefit for people. There's kind of an ambivalence oftentimes with a lot of these family relationships. And so, you know, it could be that your partner alleviates loneliness, for instance, but it could also be that your partner drives you crazy in a lot of other ways. <laughs> and whether on balance that's good or bad for you, I mean, that may really differ according to your expectations or a lot of other types of, of, of characteristics of your context. So I don't know, I'm hesitant to make a, to, to make a really big speculation on um, whether intergenerational household relationships would operate the same way as partnerships. Um, it is a good question. The other thing I guess I would say to this too is that um, this is, these are sort of effects on average, right? A lot of people, I think rightly so, kind of celebrate the fact that we have so much more acceptability of living alone than we have in the past, right? It used to be um, much more stigmatized for people to live alone even earlier in their life, if they just, if they never partnered and were just living alone, you know, through their middle age years. And we have a whole lot more diverse kind of arrangements that people are in. And one of the things, you know, that's kind of interesting demographically is that we just have this whole growth of people, all different ages living alone more so than any time in the past. And for a lot of people, that's by choice. They really like the flexibility and the, the privacy of living alone, not having to say, share a sink and, and, a, and, a, and a bathroom with other people. They like having that space all to themselves. And, you know, one of the, we actually heard some pushback from this article that, that we had written where a lot of people said, you know, I like living alone. Who, you know, who are you to say that's, you know, it's, it's, it's loneliness inducing to have my own space. And to that, I wanted to say, 
you know, these are average effects. It, it may be that right. you prefer that, but on average, it, there does seem to be something at a population level that's really irreplaceable in terms of having other people around. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, any of my students, if you're listening or if you do end up listening to this, because I don't know if I'll assign it to my class or not, but um, this is why I always emphasize we use words like tend to or increase likelihood, uh, never absolute causation, because I can already hear some of them, as we discuss things like absolutely, uh, you know, at least here in the US, right, there's this been this huge wave or trend in, you know, van life living, right, people decking out vans, spending as much money as it would cost to buy a house to buy a van and just, you know, being able to travel and because remote work, uh, you know, has become more of an acceptance, again, large in part due to the pandemic, people are like, yeah, I don't need a house, I can move around, um, don't need all those connections. And also, if you think about it, I, I don't know the extent that it is now, but here in the US, right, you were economically punished for living alone, right? Not being married, uh, you know, different tax breaks, what have you. So I, I do think a lot of that, and I, as you put it, I uh, really uh, liked is the stigma is, you know, mellowing out a lot more. People are still spending their 20s, right? Going through this whole stage of emerging adulthood, finding themselves, getting, you know, their lives together, not rushing off to get married, start a family, uh, you know, enjoying more exploration um, is as it seems. So I definitely understand the pushback, but also highly agree. And what I was trying to tell my class is a lot of our research looks at averages, general uh, trends. So I, I do think it's very interesting because I have heard, you know, comments, people who love, you know, I can get home whenever I want. I don't have someone, you know, texting me to hurry up get here, you know, come to bed, things, you know, of that nature, as you put, which I can relate to, and many of you probably can too, the whole sharing a sink. Um, yeah, the it's the little struggles in life that I guess build up for some. Yeah, and the pandemic's an interesting note too. I, I'm thinking of the van life, you know, phenomenon. Um, I think there was a story in the Times about this just the last few months, and they said uh, it was about people who loved the van life until the pandemic came, and then it became very challenging uh, to do many things just logistically with living a van life when so many businesses were shut down and kind of the the, the places where people would go to get you know um, things they needed to live. It just was a lot more challenging, and um, I think too about living alone for a lot of people it was great when you could go easily out to restaurants or cafes and things were open. But then during that period of intense lockdown, for a lot of people, that was that moment where it was very challenging to be living alone. And so I think of these kind of moments that punctuate, these kind of unusual moments that punctuate our lives mm -hmm. where um, I feel like probably it's, it's helpful at those times for people to have a fallback and to be able to have someone else around. Um, but maybe when things are smoother sailing, it's a lot more comfortable uh, for a lot of people to, to, to you know navigate by themselves. Yeah, and that's a, that is a really good point. Um, Thing about that, it's if I'm not mistaken, during you know, like as, as you put it, the intense lockdowns, even national parks were closed, gyms were closed. And for y'all that don't know, those were prime locations to you know go if you're living the van life because they'd be great places to get showers, to hook up for you know, refill water. And um, so a lot of your stop locations are all of a sudden uh removed or denied. So yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I, I kind of starts uh, formulating some follow up questions on that, but I uh, don't want to go too off uh, on a tangent there. Um, but yeah, that really, you know, like you said, these kind of historical moments like a pandemic, right? Uh, the likes we haven't seen in uh, a cent basically a century, uh, how that has changed, especially with regards to companionships. And uh, interesting on the thought, you know, People might view it as, oh, it's nice to have, you know, someone to be in contact with, um, which, again, generally speaking, uh, everyone and uh, students, uh, because uh, from what I've been reading, too, you also have negative effects like, you know, things like partner violence, uh, increased alcohol uh, usage uh, due to lockdown. So, you know, relationships, companionship, um, but nevertheless, uh, as your article kind of pointed out, you know, talking about how re residential companionship is still just 
uh, fundamentally more beneficial uh, than having these externals. Uh, do you have any um, other comments on kind of like these findings or uh, thoughts, uh, Marcus? No, I think I think you covered a lot of the articles, um, so I don't have anything else to add on top of that. Okay, uh, fantastic. Uh, chat uh, still got a little bit of time, so if you still want to ask questions, please feel free. Uh, don't be shy. It's not like class, you know. No one can see who you are. Um, well, you know, why don't we give them another minute? Uh, Again, Marcus, I'd just like to, you know, take this time to thank you again for, uh, I know it's a bit late uh, over where you are, but I really do appreciate you taking the time to, you know, sit down, uh, discuss these articles, especially with, you know, I think they've become even more relevant given, you know, time since the pandemic, right? Uh, just this explosion of lack of connection and then everyone trying to figure it all out again, right? Can we go to events? You know, what's the protocol? What's the health safety, you know, is it still going to be the same kind of feelings and level of interaction and socialization that existed before, you know, this huge pandemic kind of threw everything into a limbo? Um, do you have any other, you know, thoughts, especially when it comes to U.S. Uh, culture, uh, because there obviously is still seems to be a lot of turmoil? Yeah, so I really have hopes of studying kind of how people emerge from um, the pandemic and kind of how whether this was kind of just a blip in terms of the social connectedness that people had or whether it kind of might change some of the trajectories of connection that people might have had for the longer term. You know, for, for a lot of people during the, the pandemic, there was a lot of strained relationships. There were a lot of families that differed on views like things uh, like vaccine mandates or even policies related to lockdowns or masking. And I'm really curious about in say in families, relationships that were strained during the pandemic, was that something that was patched up easily and that kind of relationships have kind of carried on like they were pre-pandemic levels or how common was it for there to be strains induced by the pandemic that never really healed? And so I'm hoping to kind of study kind of before pandemic towards after pandemic to see how much kind of turnover or disruption long-term there may have been in, in some people's networks. That's a fantastic uh, question and, you know, thought. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sure everyone who's listening, uh, you know of someone or you've experienced it yourself, right, as family members or close friends who have very, you know, extreme political or health related views that cause intense friction. And uh, at least I know from an anecdotal point that some have not healed, right? I still know some family members that will not talk to each other now, all because it wasn't the pandemic, but it was the political ideas and or health ideas that, you know, were kind of spurned by it. So I think that really is, you know, how is that going to impact the connectedness, right? If everyone you had these close connections with are now, you know, have this, I don't want to say grudge, uh, but kind of this, you know, uh, tension, between them that was not there before. Well, awesome. Um, okay, everyone, uh, thank you all. And uh, Marcus, is there anything uh, you'd like to add before we end this episode? No, just thanks, Colton. I, I appreciate your uh, careful reading to those articles and your good questions. And um, yeah, I, I enjoyed our conversation. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, Dr. Marcus Schaefer, uh, please check out his work in the comments. Uh, don't worry, I will be posting the articles so you can look them up uh, yourself. And as always, you know, feel free message me if you have any additional questions. I'm happy to uh, answer the best that I can. And so everyone, until the next time, uh, this has been another episode of A Social Inquiry. Uh, you know, stay well and take care and we will see you then. So thank you, everyone.